Yes, I suppose there was a momentary thought of saying, why God? But immediately he spoke into the situation and he said, don't ask why. Um, I think I grew up with the phrase, is it worth it? Everything, everything in life had to be worth it. If uh, Dad said to me as a child, uh, you don't touch the kitchen knife. And I'd look at the kitchen knife and i think, why not? <laughs> and then i think, uh -uh. Dad said don't and I knew my father. <laughs> so it wasn't worth trying it out. So everything was, is, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And I think when the, the awful m moments came in the rebellion, and, and the sense, is it really worth this? And you almost felt, no, this has gone too far. I can't, I can't accept it. It seemed that the price was too high to pay. And, and then God seemed to say, change the question. He, he has to keep on saying this to me. Quite recently, he said it again. It's not, is it worth it? It's, am I worthy? Mm. Is he worthy? It almost sounds like saying, is it worth it? Is he worthy? And it just turns the whole thing round. And instead of looking at the price I think I have to pay, is thinking of the privilege he wants to give. And always the answer is yes, he is worthy. The fact that Almighty God is willing to apparently use us in any small ways. Uh, and he's been so good to me in the, I mean, that's 1964, which is what I can't add, 45 years ago. Oh. Uh, and in those 45 years, He's shown so often in little ways, in bigger ways, people I've been able to encourage and help to realize that rape, why are we women, we feel rape's the last word of horror. And we, we don't want to talk about it, we don't think about it, we certainly don't speak about it in public or on the television screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, why? It, it's only, it's external, you're sinned against, it's not your sin, it can't touch your spirit, it's only your body. Uh, and uh, suddenly to realize that that's true, that's true. Well, it can't get into my mind or soul. I, I'm me. And um, I've been able to help so many girls to look at things like that uh, and to, to pray together with them and say, I've used this phrase, can you thank me for trusting you? I, the girl after girl, I said, can you thank? There was a lovely lady in, 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 um, in Australia. Uh, her her two-year-old son had been drowned in a family swimming pool. Mm. Uh, and. She said Christian, so-called friends, had said to her, praise the Lord. And I was angry. I thought, how could you say that to a little lady who's lost her son? Uh, and, and then she said, they said, if I can't praise the Lord, then I must have sinned in my heart. By then I was so angry. I thought, this is not the way God would speak to a dear mother. And I, I said to God, God, tell me right now, what do I say to this woman? And all that came into my mind was the memory of this dreadful night in Congo. I thought, what's that got to do with it, Lord? Nothing to do with it at all. And then he gave me these words, can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? And although the whole thing was a totally different situation, I shared this with this lady, her name was Valerie, and, I told, and little by little she came through, and we knelt together we were in a big marquee tent, and she thanked God for trusting her, even if he never told her why. I met her three or four years later, I was back in Australia taking meetings and she came up to me on a Sunday night in a Baptist church. She says, you don't remember me, do you? I said, I do, Val. I've prayed for you every day for, since I last met you. Oh. Well, she said, if, uh, she shared with her husband what I'd said to her and he couldn't take it. And yet, a few months later, a child in the a house down the same road they lived in ran out of the house and was killed by a passing car. The parents were not Christians, in fact, they were of another faith. And she said, we went and comforted the parents. And because they saw how we had taken the death of our son, they allowed us to comfort them. And over these four years, we've had the joy of leading first one and then the other to put their trust in the Lord Jesus mm. Christ. And now we know why God took our son home. And these sort of ways, I can look back and say, now I know. We, he doesn't have to tell us why. Sometimes probably doesn't tell us why. And yet Helen, Dr. Helen, God so powerfully allowed you to see in the horror in yes. 1964, Yes. not just why, but to reveal to you that what was happening was an answer to your own prayers That's right. for these people that you had served and longed to reach with the gospel for 12 years to a barrier. Yes. How did God use your suffering to turn that around? 
Uh, You'll have to tell the story. Yes, I'll have to tell the story. Well, we were taken away and put in a prison. And uh, one day they came to me in the prison. And everybody else around was protecting me because I had in many ways suffered more than many of them. But I heard them asking, that we were in a convent. They were asking Mother Superior where was... Nobody knew my English name. They all called me Mama Luca, Mama Luca. who was the doctor of the area. Uh, and they said, oh, they didn't have a Mama Luca. They only had my English name on the list. But anyway, they were saying that a Greek woman uh, who was expecting a baby was in great pain and they needed the doctor's help. So I went and I went with them and I went down and we went downtown and I got a rebel soldier on either side of me with guns. And uh, you were in pretty rough shape. I was pretty rough shape myself. <laughs> and they took me down to this home where, I don't know, there were possibly as many as 80 Greek Cypriots who were the uh, commercial workers of the area. And they were there with their wives, with their children, thrown into this house, taken captive by these rebels. And they, they all knew me. I'd been their doctor for 12 years. And there was no other doctor in the area but me. Uh, and, uh, but it was as though nobody knew me. Their eyes were down, they were de deep distress, and nobody looked up and I had to walk through them, climb over them into a room at the back where there was this little lady lying on a bed, obviously in pain, she was about seven months pregnant. And I was saying, God, what do you want me to do? I got rebel soldiers either side of me, uh, and God seemed to tell me what to do. Now, I, I could speak English and French and Swahili and a little bit of Lingala, but I couldn't speak Greek. So we had five languages there between us, and the rebels only knew two of them. So I would examine the woman and say in Swahili, does it hurt here? Then I'd repeat it in Bengali, does it hurt here? Then I'd say it in French, does it hurt here? And then I'd say in English to the Greeks, would you translate it into Greek, please? A and the rebel soldiers presumed I was saying the same thing again, mm -hmm. uh, all the way down the line. And medical I, talk. It, medical talk. I talked to her and after a bit I said, well, I'm going to give you some meds, I'm going to give you some meds, I'm going to give you some meds and I'm going to pray with you. Will you pray the prayer after me in your own language? And I, I just gave them the gospel and you I talked prayed to them about them, Jesus. Talked to them about Jesus and said how Jesus had died for them and all they had to do. And I prayed a prayer, a children's prayer of acceptance. And I heard all around the room the muttered Amen. Amen. They were with me, they were following me in their distress. When I eventually left the house, they were all looking up and smiling and they wanted to shake my hands. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful. And, God, you are marvellous. You were like, they've, all these years I've preached them, they've never wanted to listen. But now because they know I suffered worse than they did, so they're willing to listen. They were open. And your life, this whole chapter, uh, what, what absolutely blew me away as the initially shattered fresh Christian thinking, this isn't supposed to happen to someone who's put their trust in the Lord Jesus and is serving him with all she has, but to see that you actually were a type of Christ. You, through yes. this journey, you even had the mock trial. Tell our viewers about that. <laughs> yes, they, they, they'd rounded us up. We were living in another place at that time under house arrest. They'd rounded us up, they'd beaten us, they'd driven us barefoot along rough gravel roads and it was awful uh, and they'd taken us to this place and we were driven into put into one room about eight women and two men all of us protestant missionaries and then they called me out alone these were the old moments we dreaded and the little rebel soldier made me sit down on a chair in the room he was sitting in uh, and um, at that moment, a truck drove in. It was about, it was sometime, let's say, nine o'clock at night, I don't remember. A truck drove in with yelling, yelling soldiers on it, and a small, uniformed soldier came into the room, probably some lieutenant of the rebel army, and um, he be was talking rapidly to the little leader of the group I was with. And then he turned and looked at me, and he said, and he used my African name, aren't you Mama Luca? Aren't you the doctor from Nebobongo? Well, I didn't say yes. It didn't pay to be Mama Luke in those days. So he's, uh, the other soldier said, yes, she is. And he turned around and said, don't you touch her. She's good. When I was wounded at the beginning of this war, I went to her hospital. And he had come to me and he had a bullet wound. And it had just gone along and out here in two little wounds. And we'd put a bit of a Band-Aid on both and gave him a cup of coffee. <laughs> and God healed him. And he showed this, he undid his shirt, and there were the two bullet wounds. 
Uh, and he said, she's good, don't tell. And, and he turned, took me by the hand, took me out, put me with the other missionaries. And the, it was amazing because, yeah, I suppose I left out the bit in the middle. The, the leader of the rebels had said to me, um, you're going to be my wife. And if you mm. agree to be my wife, I promise you the other women will not be touched. And in a sense, he was giving me the ability to preserve them from rape and wickedness and cruelty. Mm. Uh, it's a choice you can't make. You, you, you can't say yes or no to either side. I, I would have going to come his wife. But, but, uh, Tell us about standing in front of 800 men who'd already been primed to call out, she's a liar. They took me away and uh, I'd been very badly beaten up and my glasses were broken and I couldn't see without them and my face had been all beaten up and I was in a bad state. And they drove me away and I, I could just about see light coming in. I couldn't see anything else. And it was just as daylight was breaking, we came into a clearing of a, f a forest village. They beat the talking drums and these men came out from all around. Nobody dared not to in those days. The rebel soldiers were the only people with guns uh, and you did as you were told. And there were about 800 of them filling this courtyard. And uh, I was to be tried by the, um, I don't know, lieutenant of the group. Uh, and uh, he asked me something that had happened the week before by this other rebel soldier who had raped me. Uh, and I wasn't going to speak up in loud in front of all these men, so I sort of dropped my voice. So he slugged me with a gun across my face and I couldn't stand the pain, so I spoke up. Uh, and uh, we had this mock trial and they had all been told that at a certain given sign, they would say, she's a liar, she's a liar. And what do we do with her? And they had a word, we never did understand what it really meant, mateko, mateko but it meant crucify her. Really? And you, you knew you would die, you didn't know how, and there came the moment in the trial scene when they must have been given the sign, and suddenly, these 800 men, suddenly, instead of seeing me as the hated white foreigner, they saw me as their doctor, and they rushed forward, they pushed the rebel soldiers out of the way, and they took me in their arms, uh, and in that wonderful moment, the, the, the black-white barrier had gone, uh, and they said, she's ours. They used a word in Kibbutu, which really meant uh, she's blood of our blood and bone of our bone. Uh, and uh, the, the rift between dark skin and pale skin was driven away and we were reunited as one. And God was so good. He used so many things that, that uh, he was working out his own wonderful purposes. Many, many came to the Lord through those days of suffering. Uh, and um, God Because was you gracious. said yes to God. Yes, Can I, I guess use your right. body? <laughs> that's right. Yes. The walls of division were broken down. Yes. And the kingdom was expanded. This is before you ever got to reach people who are struggling and stumbling and broken all over That's the globe. Right. Another one of my favorite parts of this story. <laughs> Your director, field director, regularly sent you books. And one of the books you were encouraged to read, you sent back, you did not want to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. <laughs> and what did you say to that field director? Well, I really, I sent the book back very politely. You didn't do anything else with our field director. Uh, and I said, I can't read this. I said, if God ever asks me to be burned at the stake, uh, I'll say yes, but I won't be singing. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it, it, I just couldn't take it all. And then very shortly after that... Three months later. That's right. We were taken away and we were stood before a firing squad and we were singing every song, chorus, hymn we could think of with the name of Jesus. We were singing in English, French, Swahili, anything. So the last word that these rebel soldiers would hear before they shot us was the name of Jesus. Now you weren't singing to impress your captors. <laughs> Something else was very real in that moment when you thought you were about to die. Yes. And that was the presence of Jesus. Jesus was there. He, he was so wonderfully there and it was, it was privileged. It was just this wonderful certain knowledge I was going to go to be with Jesus. And really at that minute, nothing else counted. And uh, he is wonderful. <laughs> Just for the last minute, we have to set the record straight because this is a story that has gone viral and I have confirmed it is your chapter. The crate with the hot water bottle <laughs> and the doll. Can you quickly recap that story? Well, it's just, I've been called out in the middle of the night to the maternity half part of our hospital and a woman giving birth to her second child, but sadly, 
I thank God this rarely happened, but we lost the mother. The mother died and we delivered this tiny premature baby. And um, I sent the midwives off to, to get the little cots we put these tiny babies into and uh, cotton wool to wrap them in and oil. And so another midwife went out to fill a hot water bottle to put beside the boat baby. And she came back into the room and said, I'm awfully sorry, doctor. I took the hot water bottle, I boiled the kettle, and as I filled the bottle, burst hot water bottle. And she said, it is our last. Well, I said, okay. You put the baby as near to the fire as you can. You've got to keep the baby warm. If the baby gets cold, it will die, etc., etc. And next day at midday, I went to have prayers with our orphanage children, as I did every day. And any of the children wanted to gather around me for prayer time, and I'd give them different things to pray about. And this particular day, I told the children of this tiny baby and asked them to pray for the nurses that they would stay awake all night to keep that baby warm. If the baby got cold, it would die. I mentioned that the baby had a two-year-old sister who was crying because her mummy had died. I mentioned the burst hot water bottle. During prayer time, different children prayed for different things. And then one little 10-year-old girl, Ruth, she prayed in the usual blunt way of our African children. Please, God, send us a hot water bottle. Now, God, it'll be no good tomorrow. Send it this afternoon. If it comes tomorrow, the baby will be dead. <laughs> I, I, I'm sort of swallowing hard. I said, while you're about it, God, would you send a dolly for the little two-year-old sister so that she'll know that Jesus really loves her. And that afternoon, the parcel came. It was the first parcel I ever, I'd been out there four years. I'd never had a parcel from home. Uh, and despite the fact that I live on the equator, somebody packing that parcel had been prompted by God to put in a hot water bottle. And a child from my Bible class at home had put in a dolly for a little girl. And uh, it came that afternoon in answer to it. 10-year-old child's prayer. And the amazing thing was, you know, that parcel had been on the way five months to get to us. It had left England oh, in July, before you reached call us in December. Answers, That's absolutely it. Lord. And it came that afternoon because a child prayed and uh, it's, that's lovely. That, that's that's my my version of the hot water bottle and the dolly story. I hope <laughs> this is not your last trip to Canada. And before I let you go, Helen, would you just say the question, into which camera? This one, one more time. The question that has shattered and reformed our thinking. Can you thank me for trusting you with this experience, even if I never tell you why? Uh, and he doesn't have to tell us why, but he often does in his gracious, loving mercy. <laughs>